Two suspects are in FBI custody after a truckload of explosives was discovered around the George Washington Bridge. The Levon Affair was an Israeli terrorist operation in Egypt known as Operation Susanna, in which Egyptian, American, and British-owned targets in Egypt were bombed in the summer of 1954. In the early 1950s, the U.S. was becoming friendlier with Egypt and was moving to influence the British to leave the Egyptian Suez Canal, which they had manned for almost 20 years. The apartheid state of Israel would not tolerate the British leaving and elements within Israel began planning a variety of terrorist attacks on British, Egyptian and American targets. These attacks would then be blamed on so-called Muslim extremists. This would incite the anger of the British and the Americans towards Egypt and Islam and sour the burgeoning relationship between Egypt, America and Britain. This plan for a series of false flag terrorist attacks was codenamed Operation Susanna. A group of Egyptian Jews was recruited to carry out the attacks. Jews in the diaspora that are recruited are known as Sayanin. The first bomb went off on July 2nd when a post office in Alexandria was firebombed. On the 11th of July, the Anglo-Egyptian Suez negotiations, which had been blocked for nine months, got underway again. Despite the British assuring Israel that stockpiled weapons would not be given to the Egyptians, on July 14th, the Jewish terrorists firebombed U.S. information agency libraries in Cairo and Alexandria. However, that same day, a phosphorus bomb exploded prematurely in one of the terrorists, Philip Natanson's pocket just as he was about to enter the British-owned Rio Cinema in Alexandria. His arrest and the subsequent confession led to the breakup of the whole ring. However, while the plot was being investigated, the Zionist Jewish terrorists started fires in two Cairo cinemas in the central post office and the railway station. After the plot was uncovered, many tried to spin it as an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. As the trial of the Jewish terrorists became more and more public, Israel was forced to do damage control. They claimed that the Egyptians were tipped off and allowed the attacks to happen. They also singularly scapegoated the defense minister Pinhas Levon to prevent the exposure of the real group inside the apartheid state of Israel who planned Operation Susanna and several other false flag terrorist attacks. But this would not be the last time America's so-called ally and friend and recipient of over $150 billion in aid would attack her. The demolition team set off when you see the old demolition to these old buildings. It looks like one of those scenes of an old building being purposely dynamited and blown up. Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The way the structure is collapsing, this was the result of something that was planned. It's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. June 8, 1967 was a clear, sunny day with unlimited visibility. It was such a nice day that as the USS Liberty floated in international waters 14 miles north of the Sinai Peninsula, sailors were sunbathing on the spy ship's deck. But all wasn't as tranquil as the sunny day would convey, for June 8th also marked the fourth day of the Six-Day War, which involved Israel, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. 
Monitoring the situation was the USS Liberty, a World War II freighter that had been converted into a spy vessel by the NSA, the National Security Agency. In fact, the Liberty was the most sophisticated and identifiable intelligence ship in the world at the time, with dozens of large antenna, state-of-the-art electronic intercept equipment, moon-bound satellite dishes, massive aerials, plus a TRSS comm system that sent real-time messages to the Pentagon. The Liberty also also flew a large 5 by 8 foot American flag, was freshly painted with large white numbers and letters on its bow and hull, and contained no offensive weaponry except for four 50 caliber machine guns for defensive purposes. These details are important to keep in mind because at 8 o'clock a.m. as the Liberty floated in international waters at less than 5 knots with a 5 by 8 foot American flag hurling in the wind. A squadron of Israeli jets circled the ship at least a dozen times. These reconnaissance planes flew at such low levels, as close as 200 feet, that the sailors aboard the Liberty actually waved to the Israeli pilots. And, as we will show later in this documentary, those commanding these Israeli jets not only ID'd this ship as being of American origin, they also positively ID'd it as being the USS Liberty. Despite being fully aware of its status, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, three unmarked Israeli Mystere and Mirage III fighter jets pummeled the Liberty with rockets and cannon fire. These bombers initially went after the ship's antenna and electronics dishes, in the process filling the American flag full of holes. As sailors fled for cover, Liberty crewmen hoisted a new, even larger 7 by 13 foot flag into the air. But this new, even larger flag didn't stop the Israeli onslaught as they sprayed the Liberty with napalm, the highly incendiary substance burning the sailors' flesh. While this unprovoked act of war was taking place, radio operators aboard the Liberty tried to signal for help. But their SOS distress messages were not heard because the Israelis had deliberately jammed all five of the Liberty's emergency radio channels, a phenomenon that shows quite clearly that the interfering party was aware of their target beforehand and had previously zeroed in on it, for to jam a stranger's radio in such a rapid manner is virtually impossible. Unable to get help, the USS Liberty, with eight sailors already dead and 100 wounded, including Commander William McGonagall, was a sitting duck for the Israelis who at 2.24 p.m. sent in three torpedo boats loaded with thousands of pounds of explosives. With their target already in flames, the Israelis bombed the Liberty with shells, quickly killing 25 more men. As firefighters and medical personnel tried to put out fires and save their ship and crew, they were repeatedly machine gunned by Israeli aircraft. By 3.15 p.m., after it was apparent that the Israelis didn't want to leave a single man alive, the crew abandoned ship. But as the surviving crewmen fled for their lives, Israeli warships at close range sprayed those rafts aboard the ship with gunfire, along with those carrying the wounded that had already been lowered into the water. It was a sickening display of brutality and savage inhumanity, a total lack of regard for human life. The Israelis wanted no survivors.